Sedan är det så att färdsätt på den. Hedens frågor är bara. Wärs underwalknum. Wärs mindum far. Beowulf. Possibly um, the best epic ever written by anyone at any point in uh, history according to my unbiased opinion as far as epic poetry goes. There are, there's literature that I prefer by far, um, but as far as epics go, this is my favorite. And in the grand scale of literature, this is in my top five for sure. Um, fantastic. And so when it comes to Norse mythology and we're talking about heroes, uh, we're really not going to hit very much beyond Beowulf, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But you guys depending on what year this is. If it's the year 2052, I'm not sure, but in the year 2014, uh, you are doing a little research on your own uh, for that hero project. The Celtic and Norse heroes were combined in that project so that you guys could look at that. So the one that we're going to talk about in this last lecture for Norse mythology is really going to focus more on Beowulf than anything else. So, uh, Beowulf, we're going to look at this. I love it, and this is a very quick overview. I'm not sure how much you have to write down on this. Uh, if you need to pause or if it's, there's some portions that um, are hard to see, I know I have some images that pop up um, kind of covering some of the text in this, this particular presentation. If that's the case, um, mark those points on your notes. So let me know, and whenever I come back, whenever that may or may not be, we can talk about those and we can make sure that you have that information. For today, though, enjoy the story. Enjoy Beowulf. It's just, it's such an awesome, uh, epic tale. Now, if you've seen the movie um, and if you know me at all, you probably heard me say that it's, uh, there is a movie that was made. Now, this is the year 2014, so this was even several years ago here. It was a computer animated movie, uh, also having Anthony Hopkins in it um, and Angelina Jolie. Uh, it's not, in my opinion, personally, a horrible depiction of Beowulf, and if you've seen it, your life may or may not have already been ruined, but hopefully uh, we can overcome that because this is a fantastic story. I actually took my wife to see that movie whenever we were in high school, because I, or college rather, because I love I love the, the the story, and so we went there, and I've told her about all this stuff, like, man, Beowulf is so great, oh, this is so awesome, and we're like halfway through it, she looks over at me, and it's like, what is this? This is what you like? And it was it was like like a defeating moment for me because what she was seeing and what I knew was really there were not the same thing. So I want to give you a little taste of what the real story is like. Hopefully you enjoy it. If not, I apologize ahead of time, but you should enjoy it because it's fantastic. So Beowulf, a couple things you need to know to understand sort of the the significance of this story. It is the longest of the surviving Old English epic poems, and it is only uh, surviving in part. So it is a very long poem in itself, but uh, we've lost some of it. There are portions that were lost in, the, I believe, the Fire of Alexandria. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's where it was. And so the manuscript that we have is even, there are portions that are missing from that. So some of the translations we have as you're reading them, there will be portions that kind of don't make sense, and they've tried their best to piece them together, but there are portions of the story even missing. But we still get a very nice, broad storyline uh, nonetheless. Now, this is an early English epic. It's, in fact, the earliest English epic. It's written in an old English that we would not recognize, as you noticed from the prologue that I may or may not have been reading at the very beginning of this little clip. Um, it's a very Germanic-sounding old English. So you would imply that this was a Celtic-rooted uh, story in mythology scheme. But even though it was recorded by someone who would be considered Celtic, uh, it's a Norse tale. So it takes place in what would be modern-day Scandinavia and Denmark, which are very Norse locations. And the themes that are addressed are very Norse as well. Uh, there's also a very uh, strong Christian influence, most likely from those Celtic writers. <laughs> That, that shows up too, but uh, a very, um, very Norse story. So that's why that that that's why it's being taught at this point in the the class instead of back in the Celtic 
uh, portion, and you'll see that always brought up with Beowulf. It's sort of a, uh, an oddity because it could go into either one of those. It's English, but it's Norse, okay? Some things you need to know, a uh, couple of vocabulary words, and you will probably, and when I say probably, I mean definitely, see these again. Um, so Thane, Patriarch, Malignant, Anathema, and Stalwart. A Thane is just an Anglo-Saxon knight. Okay, and I used that term even when we were talking about uh, Thanes in, um, or knights, rather, in uh, the King Arthur story. So a Thane just means a knight. A patriarch is sort of that, that male leader, that older, oldest man in a particular group. Sometimes he's a founder of a particular group. He's that father, grandfather figure who is in control. Uh, malignant means evil in nature. Uh, so malignant is not a compliment. Neither is anathema. Uh, anathema means devoted to evil or accursed. So um, if ever uh, you have someone that you're dating that calls you an anathema, no matter how romantic they say it, anathema, 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 always an insult. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, not a good thing. Stalwart, there's always someone who thinks that I'm saying Star Wars at this point, but stalwart is a good thing. It means having unwavering or outstanding strength and vigor in body, mind, and spirit. So definitely that characteristic that you would want out of a thing, a knight. Okay. A couple things you're also going to need to know are characters. In Beowulf, um, there are some weird names. So let me just give you these to the best of my ability. Uh, Beowulf. Pretty easy one there. Uh, he is your protagonist, your main character. So part one of the story, he is the Thane of Hedralak, and he has superhuman strength, and he is a professional hero. So he does heroic stuff because that's what heroes do. Then in part two, he ends up going back to the land of Agitz, and he takes over the throne through a series of events that I will explain, and he is the elderly king of the Agitz. So that is Beowulf. Hedralak is the king of the Geats in the earlier portion of the story. Uh, this is Beowulf's uncle. Hrothgar is the elderly king of the Danes, so where Beowulf goes to help uh, when he fights Grendel. That's the kingdom of Hrothgar. And then Grendel is this first monster that he fights. He is a enchanted um, beast of some kind, so there are different depictions, but he is a horif horrific monster that cannot be harmed by weapons, and he is causing destruction on the land. Uh, Umfirth is Hrothgar's advisor. You always have a character like this in most stories. He's that wicked counselor. Um, he does not like Beowulf. He's kind of got some jealousy for him, but he does come around eventually um, once Beowulf, you know, like saves his entire nation. But um, earlier on, he's trying to kind of undermine Beowulf and convince Hrothgar, but Beowulf's not really all he's cracked up to be. But then later, he does actually award Beowulf with his famous sword, Hrunting, and gives it to him to slay the next monster, which is Grendel's mother. Uh, Grendel's mother is exactly who you would expect her to be, Grendel's mother. Uh, she's the second monster that he fights. She is not just some, like, lady. She is a monster, a beast. Uh, Wiglaf is the thane of Beowulf. Uh, whenever he becomes king, um, Wiglaf is one of his thanes. He's also the last surviving kinsman of Beowulf. So when Beowulf dies, he is the heir to Beowulf's throne, and he does help Beowulf in the slaying of the final creature that he battles in the epic, which is a dragon. So basically, you can divide the plot into these sections, and you're going to want to um, circle this, put a star next to it. This is going to be something that I will expect you to remember. Uh, you can divide it into two parts, Beowulf, the young warrior, and Beowulf, the old ruler of the Geats. You can also divide it into three battles, Beowulf versus Grendel, Beowulf versus Grendel's mother, and Beowulf versus the dragon. So that's sort of the general overview of the plot. So that's how it kind of works. So here is Beowulf, the young warrior. He is going to the land of the Danes, doing things that a hero does because um, heroes do heroic things. And then you have Beowulf, the old ruler, where he battles with the dragon, and he is the elderly king of the Geats. So what I'm going to do at this point is actually summarize the story for you. Um, so follow along as we go. I'll just kind of retell it. I think, I think that's the last bell that you will hear during this lecture. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe it will last for another hour, but... Um, 
If not, I will get you through the story. That way you can kind of have an appreciation for what Beowulf is all about. All right, so basically the way the story starts is you have Grindel attacking Herod. Herod is the Mead Hall of the Danes, Danes being ruled by Rolfgar. And what would happen is every night all the warriors would be eating in this mead hall. They would all be celebrating, and along would come Grindel. And Grindel was this huge monster, and he would come in and he'd start eating people. Okay, so not a really great way to end the party. Uh, so everybody would try to attack him, but he was not able to be attacked by weapons. So all of their attempts were kind of in naught. And so you have this picture basically of a kingdom slowly being destroyed because all of their warriors are being eaten. Okay. So at this point, Beowulf shows up. Beowulf is a professional hero. And I know I've said this and I've made reference to this, but really in epics, heroes do heroic things, not necessarily out of any prompting beyond the fact that heroes need to be heroic. That's what they do. They're in seek of, they're, they're constantly seeking after a quest of some kind or something to accomplish so that they can be a hero. So heroes do heroic deeds. That's kind of how it works. So Beowulf shows up. And he says, I am here to slay your monster because I am Beowulf. Now, Beowulf and the king of the Danes kind of go back because Hrothgar and Beowulf's father knew each other. And so whenever he shows up, Hrothgar's like, all right, um, thank you. This is what's going on. Here's how I want you to do this. And so Beowulf decides, he's like, listen, um, this monster cannot be hurt by weapons. And so instead of going... Uh, at him that way, I have a plan. I'm going to sleep in the meat hall tonight at Herod. And when he comes, I'm going to meet him on equal terms. I am not going to be wearing any armor. I will not have any weapons beyond these weapons right here. And I am going to take this guy down. Now, in that depiction of the movie that um, I am not a big fan of, um, they decide to make it to where he decides not to be wearing much clothing at all. Um, unnecessary and not accurate. He's just not wearing armor. He is still fully clothed, okay? And so he's laying there sleeping. In comes Grindel. Now, the first thing Grindel does at this point, as Beowulf's sort of like laying there in anticipation, just waiting to see what's going to happen, Grindel comes up and eats the guy sleeping next to him. So there goes one of Grindel's men. Really disappointing, probably disgusting. I've never been sleeping on the floor when someone next to me got eaten, but I'm assuming it'd be kind of a negative experience. So in comes Grindel, he eats this guy, and then he uh, goes for Beowulf next. Now when Beowulf is about to be eaten, uh, Grindel reaches down and Beowulf just grabs a hold of his arm. And this is basically how the battle between Beowulf and Grindel works out. It's sort of a kind of a very drawn out arm wrestling match. So Beowulf has a hold of Grindel's arm. Grindel is trying to escape. He's this huge monster. He does not like this. Uh, Beowulf is holding on hard. So they're just like dragging each other all around this meat hall, like destroying everything. But there's not much more happening as far as combat goes beyond Beowulf just not letting go. So it's almost like little kids. Like I have a, a three-year-old and a almost two-year-old right now. And this is kind of how they fight, like grabbing hold of each other and, hey, leave me alone. No, I don't want to leave you alone. Hey, leave me alone. Hey, I don't want to leave you alone. So that's sort of what's going on here. Like he just won't let go of Grindel. But what ends up becoming a little bit more intense than the way that my children fight is eventually Beowulf ends up ripping Grindel's arm off. Now that's a little bit extreme, but he's a hero. So he does this. So he rips off Grindel's arm. And so here he is holding this arm of a monster. Grindel is bleeding out. He runs away and dies. Okay. So that is the defeat of Grindel. At that point, Beowulf takes this arm that he has. He hangs it up over the Mead Hall at Herat as kind of this sign of victory. And everyone is happy. So all of the uh, Danes come in. They rejoice in the fact that Grindel has been killed, that Beowulf has been victorious. Uh, they throw this party. Uh, at this point is when um, Umferth is forgiving Beowulf. He gives him fronting uh, just not long after this as a sign of his appreciation. But while they are partying, uh, more stuff happens. Okay, They're in this party. And they hear this scream. 
Now they know it's not Grindel. They know it's got to be somebody else. And most people realize that this must be Grindel's mother. Now Grindel's mother ends up deciding to pick up where Grindel left off. Uh, she too decides to start eating people out of the meat hall, but her plan is a little bit more coof. Uh, instead of coming in and just eating people right there on the spot, she comes in, steals them away, and then takes them to her lair to kind of eat them in private. I guess that's more respectful, I'm not sure. But uh, this obviously can't go on. <clears throat> Beowulf, highly offended that he has come to save this nation, and then by destroying one monster, all he did was spark the anger of another. So he says, no, this cannot, this cannot happen. I am going to go and defeat this monster one on one in her own lair. I'm not going to wait for her to come to us. I'm going to go to her. He takes Hrunting, his sword with him, and he goes to her lair. Now she lives in this underground cave. So it's like he had to swim sort of underwater and then come back up the cave to find her. And so that's what he does. Now, to give you a little depiction, there's a there's an image here on your screen of what Beowulf's mother probably looked like. She she or Beowulf Grindel's mother. She is a she's a monster. Okay, uh, in that movie, she's played by Angelina Jolie. She's supposed to be uh, like this beautiful temptress type of character, I guess. Uh, that's not that's not it. Okay, that that kind of ruins the story because she too is a creature, a a monstrous creature who is actually more intimidating than. Uh, Grindel himself. So Beowulf gets down there. He goes to fight her. Uh, Hrunting is completely useless on her. Uh, she too is enchanted just like her son. So weapons cannot harm her. And so they go into this battle. Now this battle, far more intense, takes up a lot more of the poem as well because they are actually in this kind of intense wrestling match like that picture is showing. If you can kind of tell what's going on, it's, the creature actually has him in a headlock and he is about to have his head kind of popped off. And that's true, because in this, this battle, Beowulf is losing basically the entire time, okay? And so she has the upper hand. Uh, she is destroying him in combat. They're fighting all over this cave. And then we see that this truly is uh, a story of mythic proportions, because in myths, much like most stories, the convenient occurs in order to prolong the story. And so while they are wrestling, they trip, okay? Beowulf is about to die. If this trip wouldn't have happened, uh, he would have been a goner. And so they trip and fall. And as he falls, he rolls into this giant cupboard. And when he rolls into this cupboard, he realizes that the cupboard is full of weapons made by the giants. Okay, so talk about a convenient little setting here. Now, giants, we know, uh, this might be something that helps you, having had the little bit of Norse discussion we've had so far. A giant is essentially a god, right? So these are weapons of the gods, not just fronting some sword made by man, but these are weapons made by the gods, gigantic swords that Beowulf can yield because of his massive strength. Otherwise, they would be completely useless to him. And so as he's laying there on the ground, he notices that a sword has fallen down from when he hit this cupboard. He grabs a hold of it. As she's running towards him, he swings up. And cuts off her head. So do that work of convenience. He defeats Grindel's mother, takes her head back up to uh, the Danes, shows Hrothgar, and is victorious over the next monster. Now this is a big difference from what happened in the movie, and so I hope you realize it is far superior to that story as well. Now after this goes down, uh, Beowulf goes back, there's much celebration, and then he eventually returns to his kingdom, the kingdom of the Geats. Now when he gets back, uh, eventually Hedralek dies. Now Hedralek was the king of the Geats, that is his uncle, and he had a son, a son that was the rightful heir. Now when this son was supposed to take control, the Beowulf's aunt, the queen of the Geats, came to Beowulf. And she said, Beowulf, listen, uh, I don't think my young son is ready to be king. Uh, he's not the warrior that you are. He's not the heroic presence that you are. And so I really think you need to take over the throne and become the king. Now here we see something. A, a lot of the time, Beowulf is, is very arrogant. He's a hero. He does heroic things. And because of that, he has this persona of I am the man. But at this point, we see that there's some humility to Beowulf's character as well. He refuses to take the throne. He says, no, um, he is the rightful king, and I'm not going to take the throne 
uh, from the person who is supposed to be in charge of me. I will help him. Uh, I will guide him until he is old enough to, to rule on his own, but I will not take the throne uh, from my king. And so uh, for several years, he rules alongside this, this son. Uh, but eventually, the son dies. And the way the son dies is actually uh, quite tragic. He invites uh, neighboring enemies to come to his kingdom and see his riches. And when they do this, it leads to a battle where he ultimately dies because of his ignorance. Uh, at that point, Beowulf does become king. Uh, he had been ruling along his side for quite some time and then rules for another 50 winters, as they say, and rules very well. And so at this point where the story picks back up, uh, we have a Beowulf who's probably about 100 years old. Um, so much, much older than the young warrior that we had in the beginning. And so then uh, we are taken to a totally different situation where you have Beowulf, the old king, ruling in a time of peace and prosperity for the Geats. And it goes away to this, this slave. And so this slave is running from his master. We don't really know what's going on. Like, how is he connected to Beowulf? What is going on? And so he's running from his master. And as he's running away, he stumbles into the lair of a dragon. Now, dragons are known for guarding something treasure. Uh, that's what dragons do. Much like a hero does heroic things, dragons do dragonly things. And what dragons do, contrary to Shrek, they do not marry donkeys, they actually guard treasure. And so for 300 years, this dragon has been guarding this treasure of this prince that had passed away, the last of his kind. He had left all of his treasures there, and the, garden, the guardian, this dragon, has been guarding and protecting this treasure ever since. When the slave comes in, he stumbles not upon the dragon, but upon his treasure, and he finds this beautiful golden cup. And he thinks, man, if I would take this back to my master and tell him that there's more where this came from, maybe he will accept me back and I won't be killed because right now I'm a slave that's ran away. But if I return with riches, then I will be rewarded and I will not only get my place back, but maybe even more. Uh, prominence and recognition. So he steals this one cup and he runs back to his master. Now this dragon has been guarding this treasure for 300 years. It knows everything about every piece of treasure within his lair. And so when he sees that cup is missing, uh, he is furious. And the dragon does what dragons do and he starts burning stuff. Now the stuff that he's burning which is this village nearby and the surrounding areas, happens to be in the kingdom of Beowulf. Now, Beowulf does not take lightly to this. Um, he is the king of the Geats. He is Beowulf, the protector of his kingdom, the warrior and hero of all heroes. He can't have a dragon just going around burning stuff in his kingdom. So he decides that he is going to go and he is going to defeat this dragon. Now his thanes say, all right, uh, we will get a group of people together. We will go out. We will take over this dragon. We will do it together. And Beowulf says, no, 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 no. Uh, you don't understand. Um, I'm Beowulf. All right. Uh, I, I do this, this stuff alone. And they're like, wait, Beowulf, you know, we know you did, but you're older now. You're 100 years old. We can we can do this our, with you. And and that's the issue. See, he, he needs help. He is 100 years old, but he still has that pride inside of him. So he says, listen, I've never been defeated in battle. I, I defeated Grendel. I defeated Grendel's mom. I have defeated many monsters. I've never lost. So, well, of course, no, there was that one time. I did lose a race. It was a swimming race. And uh, I was swimming against a, a very famous swimmer, the, the greatest swimmer in all the land, in fact. And he challenged me to a race across the sea. And, you know, it was a quite a bit of a distance. And uh, he did beat me. You know, I will give you that. I, I did lose that race. Of course, he was the best. Uh, and uh, he was swimming in his swimming gear. And I had my, my full armor on because that's how I roll. But, you know, he did. He defeated me. Well, of course, you know, he swam across without encountering any obstacles. And as I was swimming across, I was attacked by several sea monsters, and I slew them all. Uh, but he, he did beat me. But I, 
I will say he I he barely got there before I did, um, even though I was in full armor and defeating sea monsters along the way. So I mean, I guess if you want to call that a defeat, yes, I've been defeated, but really, I'm Beowulf. This is what I do. I'm going to slay this dragon by myself. So we have this, this arrogance going on. Uh, he definitely wants to take them um, to show, or definitely wants to take this dragon by himself, protect his kingdom, prove that he is still the leader that he has always been. So he decides to take um, some things with him, okay? Uh, he takes 11 things and the slave. The slave is leading the way. Now, he did not take them to accompany him on the battle. He just wants them to watch and see how awesome he is. So they go, they go to the um, cave, and Beowulf is starting to feel this kind of inevitability of death. Okay, so there's some, something sort of changing. And he approaches the lair of the dragon, and a dragon comes out, and he's breathing fire. And as he's doing this, Beowulf feels fear. And not only does he feel fear, but all the thanes run away, except for one, Wiglaf, his lone kinsman. And he turns and he says, guys, where are you going? We have to stay with, with Beowulf. He has always been so good to us. He's taken care of us. He's provided for us. He's, he is the great ring giver. So when we conquer other, other lands, he has always been faithful to give us a portion of this treasure. And he's provided for us in so many different ways. We can't abandon him now in his time of need, but they all run. And so you have Beowulf versus a dragon, and one guy left saying, watching this happen. So Beowulf fights the dragon. And basically, uh, the dragon very quickly gains the upper hand because Beowulf is 100 years old, and he's a dragon. So it kind of just makes sense, right? So uh, Beowulf has this iron shield that he had made specially for this. Uh, bad decision because when iron gets hot, uh, you can't hold it anymore. So he has to throw aside this uh, iron shield. So then the dragon actually bites Beowulf's neck, uh, and he has a venomous teeth. And so uh, not only is he being burned, but he's being slowly poisoned to death as well. Uh, at this point, uh, Beowulf then stands, and he grabs his sword, and he swings it at the dragon, but the sword shatters, okay? Now, when you're reading the story, though, it doesn't say that it shattered because the dragon's skin was so thick or anything like that. It actually says that because of Beowulf's amazing strength, uh, he shatters the sword because he just swung too hard. So again, you have this picture of Beowulf as um, this immense character. So there he is. Um, shattered sword, poison infecting his body, burns all around, about to die, and Wiglaf comes in to help. And so he comes in uh, and kind of slides underneath the dragon and stabs the dragon in the belly, kind of wounding it. And as the dragon is wounded and moving, uh, Beowulf then grabs a dagger. Okay, and this is just very classic, um, epic type of tale. You have this almost defeated old man, 100 years old, dragon, massive monster, and Beowulf takes a dagger, a small tiny like knife sword and he ends up slaying the dragon from underneath with a dagger the dagger kills the dragon the dragon falls and beowulf is victorious now you would uh expect at this point some things to happen and some things do beowulf is laying there dying and uh, he sends to wiglaf and um, wiglaf is talking to him and he kind of expresses some regrets. You know, I'm sorry that I don't have a son to leave to be my heir, but Wiglaf, you, uh, my lone kinsman, you are you are a king and you will take care of your people. Bring me some treasure. Bring me the treasure. I want to see what I've left behind for my people. So Wiglaf goes and he brings some of the treasure and Beowulf says, at least, at least I die knowing that I provided for my kingdom. At least I die knowing that they will be provided for. And so you think that there's kind of been this humbling of Beowulf. He's given up everything for his country, given up everything for the Geats, uh, provided a great wealth to uh, <clears throat> be with them after he leaves, providing them with Wiglaf, a, a great leader to be with them after he leaves. But then the humility sort of stops at the end, and he says, Wiglaf, do one thing for me. I need you to erect a giant statue in my favor. A giant image of me that will sit by the sea so that all that come by will see this great statue of Beowulf 
and know that I was the man. <laughs> and then dies Beowulf. So the Geat people, his hearth companions, sorrowed for the lord who had been laid low. They said that of all the kings upon the earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people, and keenest to win fame. Beowulf, as translated by Henny in this copy of the book. So there's a copy of the original versus the version that, that you guys will be exposed to. Quite a bit of difference there. And then those are review questions that are filled in, so we won't be able to do the review, but you guys get the gist of that. I hope that you've enjoyed Beowulf. Hopefully you realize that it is a far superior story to maybe any movie you've ever seen that depicts this in a not-so-great way. Awesome story. Great way to end the Norse mythology unit. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. Make wise decisions.